Good afternoon, Sean. Hey, Tyler. How's it going? Man, I am surviving Hurricane Laura. How about you? Well, I am dry. That's for sure. <laughs> well, the strange thing is we're dry here in Longview, too. We had predicted seven inches of rain, Ooh. and we got maybe a sprinkle at 7 o'clock this morning, thankfully. Things have turned away from us, but um, friends over in Shreveport area and places like that are getting a lot of rain, certainly prayerful for them. Oh, my. Well, I'm glad y'all didn't get hit with it. We're uh, sunny without a cloud in the sky here in Amarillo. <laughs> Amarillo could probably use a little bit of this rain, couldn't they? We, we could probably take most of it. Uh, <laughs> a little bit of a drought here. But anyway. All right. So, Sean, we're getting into 1 Corinthians 15 today. How about that? Sounds like a plan, man. We're going back over, those of you who are joining us, thanks for being here. We're going back over some of the arguments that were made in the Reeves-Neubauer debate on AD 70, on the AD 70 doctrine, also called realized eschatology or full preterism. And we've been breaking down the arguments that were presented by both sides and trying to lay these arguments down beside scripture and, and see what comes out on the other side. Uh, there was a lot made of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, especially verse 4, in connection with the book of Hosea. And so that's what we're going to uh, focus our studies on today. So we hope you have both your Old and New Testaments with you today, and we'll get into that study here in just a few moments. Sean, what do you have to say? Well, you're right. This was an important passage in the debate. Um, you know, Bruce Reeves in the affirmative Monday and Tuesday night went through every verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and, and really, really demonstrated that this passage, that what Paul's talking about, is that there's a future bodily resurrection to be anticipated and that we know that because Jesus died, was buried, and was physically raised from the grave. And he's the first fruits. So we should be anticipating the same type of resurrection. And obviously, uh, Mr. Neubauer disagreed with that. And I think that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. And Sean, what made this, I think, very confusing for a lot of people, myself included, is that Mr. Neubauer and Mr. Reeves both affirm that they believe in a bodily resurrection. Sure. What is confusing is that both disputants were using both terms, bodily and resurrection, into completely different senses throughout the debate. Yeah, and, you know, it, it, especially for Mr. Neubauer, um, I, would have, I would have hoped there would have been a definition uh, when he used bodily resurrection uh, so that we could understand the distinction. And the reason I say for Mr. Neubauer, by the way, not to be unfair to him, he was in the negative. So yeah. if you're, if you're going to disagree, but you're going to use the same terms in the negative, I, I would hope you would tell us precisely what you mean. Now, it, it became apparent later on. Uh, but especially sure. Monday night, I think that was a little bit confusing. It was for me at first, uh, yeah, for sure. me too. You know, most of the debates that, that I have been to, and I'm thinking back to um, uh, the Reeves-Shield debate, I'm thinking to the Reeves-Weatherly debate. Mm -hmm. um, when you had those debates take place, both speakers began, whether affirmative or negative, on the first night by defining the proposition mm -hmm. of what they meant by each word. Um, both speakers didn't do that in the, in the most recent debate. And I think that that was what yeah. presented a bit of difficulty. Yeah, I noticed that too. And I, I think that was, it was probably as much of a matter of time as anything, because yeah. they both had a lot of ground to cover those first two nights. And, uh, yeah. uh, the word, the term seemed rather simple. That's not always the case. Uh, so maybe they felt like there wasn't the same need as normal to define those terms, but when you're using the same term two different ways, uh, a good, clear definition sure does help. Yeah, so if you're coming into this, this study with us and, and maybe you're not intimately familiar with uh, preterism or realized eschatology, uh, when, when you're seeing 1 Corinthians 15, 4, and you're seeing Christ died for our sins according to Scripture and was raised the third day according to the Scripture, uh, Mr. Reeves and Mr. Neubauer are going to be putting two completely different slants on those two passages. And so that's what we're going to try to sort through today is, is which perspective of 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 and 4 uh, is, is most 
legitimized in Scripture. Yeah, which one fits the context of 1 Corinthians 15 and, and the sure. rest of Scripture. Absolutely. Right. All right. So I think, Sean, a great place to begin is just by by reading the text. Um, we'll talk about this in just a moment, but the, the, the basic argument that was presented by Mr. Neubauer is that you have in 1 Corinthians 15 an inclusio argument. We'll talk about that in just a moment. That the inclusio argument begins in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 4 and is concluded in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and over to, I don't have this written down, over to verse 55, correct, Sean? O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And so because this is an inclusio argument, Mr. Neubauer would say, uh, these two verses are referring to the same subject, and everything in the middle of these two verses is referring to the same subject. So uh, we'll prov provide some evidence for that in just a moment. Don't take my word for it. But let's just read the text together and get it on the record. Sean, I'll read the first four verses of 1 Corinthians 15, if you'll take verses 54, 55, and 56. Okay. Here are verses uh, 1 through 4. I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. Paul says, Now I want to make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as the first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. All right, and then I'll, I'll pick up in verse 50. Now I say this, brethren, okay. that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and the mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on in the, the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? All right, so... That's 1 Corinthians 15. If you notice in your Bible, and hopefully your Bible will do something like this, the Bible from which you're reading, uh, in, in verse 55, in the New American Standard Bible, verse 55 is set off in small caps. That's indicating to us uh, in, in this particular edition of the New American Standard Bible that this is a quotation from the Old Testament. And indeed, this is a quotation from the book of Hosea, from Hosea chapter 13 and verse 14. Okay. Uh, the argument that was presented by Mr. Neubauer, I would agree, absolutely. I, th I think every Bible student should agree that 1 Corinthians 15, 55 is the quotation from Hebrews 13. But Mr. Neubauer's argument was more nuanced than that. And his argument was all the way back here in chapter 15 and verse 4, that Christ was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And Mr. Neubauer's argument is that there needs to be a place in the Old Testament scriptures where we read about a third day resurrection, and that the only place that we read about a third day resurrection is in uh, Hosea chapter 6 and verse 2. And so because you've got Hosea in 15.4 and Hosea in 15.55, this forms an inclusio. And so with this inclusio here, everything in the middle is the same subject, and these two bookends are the same subject. Um, but I don't explain it as well as Mr. I don't explain Mr. Neubauer's position as well as he does. So, Sean, why don't we let Mr. Neubauer explain what he means by an inclusio? Okay, we've got a quote, and we'll play that quote right now. Now, there is a literary device called an inclusio, all right? The New Testament uh, didn't have right. any chapter-verse distinctions when it was first written. The authors would start with a subject. Back together. They would end with a subject, and everything in between is the same subject. Well, that's what he's doing. Hosea so chapter six, verse I would two, submit Hosea 13, to you, verse 14. you hear it's what Mr. Newbauer says about an, an inclusio. He's saying by a resurrection of the third day, end, old You've got your bookend, and everything and in the, the end, middle is at the, the last same trump, we shall be changed. Okay. 
I, I recognize that there is such a thing as an inclusio. I think Mr. Neubauer may go a bit too far in, in his application of this, but I think he's consistent in that. Because Mr. Neubauer is forced into this position on an inclusio because of his view of the Old Testament and New Testament scriptures. Well, what do you mean by that, Tyler? Uh, Sean, let's let Mr. Neubauer explain what he means um, with how New Testament writers are kind of forced into using the Old Testament scriptures. Now, when a New Testament writer quotes from an Old Testament text, they always quote in context. They never make up new meanings. They fulfill the meaning of what the Old Testament prophet had in mind. And so we understand this idea, we should at least, between the Old and the New Testament. Okay, so let's, let's break down Mr. Neubauer's argument here, okay? His argument is that the Old Testament writers set the standard and the context for New Testament writers. Sean, do I have that correct? That's, that's, that sounds right to me. Or it sounds like that's okay. what he's saying anyway. Not trying to be dishonest, not trying to, to put words into his mouth. I think playing those quotations, uh, th that's the understanding as an audience member I took from it. Absolutely. And then he goes on to say that, or, or th the extent of the argument then would be that the New Testament writers do not use Old Testament quotes in a context different than the original. That New Testament writers only communicate the thought of the Old Testament writer. I think, I think he said that explicitly in that quotation, mm -hmm. right? And that last, that last phrase you just used, or that last point you just made, that they only communicate the thought of the Old Testament writer, I think is where this becomes problematic. Obviously, they're not taking the Old Testament writer out of context. No. The Holy no, Spirit doesn't no, take himself out of context. Exactly. There's, there's no Bible-believing person who is going to say, right, who's going to rightly say that the Holy Spirit takes himself out of context. Exactly. Exactly. But does, okay. that, does that mean, and I, I think this is a question worth exploring, does that mean that a New Testament writer could not go beyond or expand on the idea, I should say, of an Old Testament writer? Does that mean he can't make a secondary application of a, of a statement made by an Old Testament writer? Does that mean he can't explain something that maybe even the Old Testament writer himself didn't fully understand? Uh, so, so how much limitation are we willing to put on the Holy Spirit? And I think you can do all of those within the framework of a context. Would you agree? I would agree. I, I think that's a good point to bring out there, Sean. Uh, I, I think there's a principle we need to understand when it, when it comes to, to Bible study and when it comes to our understanding of the Old Testament and the New Testament. You have the Old Testament writers preparing for the coming of the Christ, right? It's, it's like the, the, the person who's, who's off and they're looking at something off in the distance. And as you get closer to, for example, to that mountain, you're going to see things more clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, Sean, a great example. You live in Amarillo. Okay. Uh, as I was driving out to Amarillo to your house for this debate, uh, as you get, you know, you get past Wichita Falls, the landscape changes. But as you get about 45 minutes out from, from Amarillo, you start to see lights on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And as you get closer and closer and closer, the lights come into focus and you begin to see the buildings and the landscape and everything about Amarillo. As you get closer, things become clearer. Right. Uh, you have the Old Testament writers talking about an event in, in the coming of Christ and everything associated with it that was a good ways off. But then you have the New Testament writers still under the inspiration of the same Holy Spirit that the Old Testament writers were, uh, revealing that picture more clearly. Yeah. I mean, you start in Genesis 3.15, you, you find out that God's going to defeat Satan. Mm -hmm. That's about as broad as you can get. <laughs> yeah. Right? Then you get all the way to Isaiah 53, and you've got a pretty clear Psalm 22. You've got a pretty clear description of the cross. I mean, Isaiah does just about everything but name Jesus, right? Yeah. Uh, and in the middle, we find out what tribe he's going to come from. We find out he's going to be a descendant of David. Uh, we, we find out a lot more details that fill in those gaps. Still don't know everything. 
but we get a much, much clearer picture as we move forward. Uh, and then when we get to the New Testament, it crystallizes. Right. And so uh, I think the point that, that we're trying to pull out here, Sean, is the idea that, you know, the, the Old Testament writers, even though they were inspired by the Holy Spirit, didn't always understand the fullness of what they were writing. But, but that's not mere speculation on, on my part. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. And these things which now have been announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. There were some things, Sean, that the Old Testament writers were not aware of in its entirety. Yes, the Holy Spirit was inspiring them to write just exactly what they did. And while the Holy Spirit knew what was going to happen, he didn't reveal everything to these Old Testament writers. It was not for them to know. Exactly. But it was for us. We're on this side of the cross. We're after the fact. And what was beforehand wasn't always the full picture, but now we've been given this full picture. Correct. And so then this idea that, that somehow New Testament writers are limited by the meaning of the Old Testament writers, I, I struggle with that concept when I read what Peter wrote here. Yeah, because if I understood what Mr. Neubauer said, and granted, I could have misunderstood, but when you limit the New Testament writer to the thought of the Old Testament writer, you almost limit them to their understanding, right. which is the very thing Peter's saying did not happen, that, that the New Testament writers were able to come out and, and show us more, tell us more. Uh, they were able to witness the things, many of the things that the Old Testament prophets spoke of, and so they could speak of it from a first person perspective in a way that the Old Testament prophet just could not speak of. I think that's a great point there. Um, and, and Sean, to this point, you know, there are, there are several times in the Old Testament where we're given prophecies of Christ, but if New Testament authors don't make that connection to Christ for us, we would never know about whom those prophecies were written. Absolutely. And, and, you know, a great example of that is Psalm 16, which Peter quotes in Acts chapter 2. But if you didn't have Peter's quotation and application, I dare say it would be impossible to know that what was being written about was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm referencing verse 10 there, Psalm 16, where it says, You will not abandon my soul to Sheol or Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Uh, now, you might make an argument based on the phrase Holy One there, uh, but that, that could reference a, a variety of things. Um, how do we know who that's talking about? How do we know that's not talking about David? Uh, well, Peter tells us. And if it wasn't for Peter going and, and stating this, I don't think you and I would be able to come up with that answer. I don't think David knew precisely who he was talking about. Um, and so, so what Peter has to do for us is add some information. It's not contained in the, in the prophecy itself so that we can understand the prophecy and in doing that, make the proper application. Right. And again, it's not the idea that New Testament writers are at liberty to take Old Testament writers out of context. That's not the point at all. I, I don't think I heard anyone in the debate make the argument that a New Testament writer is at liberty to take an Old Testament writer out of context. That's, that's kind of a strong man fallacy there. That, that was never at issue. Absolutely. I think what is at issue, though, is, is whether or not New Testament writers can take what Old Testament writers wrote about and expound on it in light of the Holy Spirit guiding them to do just that. Right, new revelation. I think that's a great point to draw out there, Sean. Now, 
Mr. Newbar, sorry, let's get back to First Corinthians 15. We got kind of sidetracked there. First oh, Corinthians we're 15 and <laughs> First Corinthians 15 and verse 4. Uh, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Mr. Neubauer made it made a big point in the debate. Find the passage of scripture. And by scripture, he would limit that to old covenant. Find a passage of scripture that predicts a three-day resurrection. Okay. Mr. Neubauer says there's one. There's only one. And that's Hosea chapter 6 and verse 2. We haven't read that yet, Sean. So let's get over there to Hosea chapter 6. Let's make sure we listen to the voice of the prophets. And here's Hosea chapter 6. Hosea 6. And you know what, Sean? I'm going to read all three verses. Okay. One, two, that. and three. Okay. Uh, reading from the uh, New King James Version. Um, Come and let us return to the Lord, Hosea writes. Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain to the earth. Okay, that he was buried and that he was raised the third day according to the scriptures. What is the what is the passage of scripture that predicts a three day resurrection? Mr. Newbauer says Hosea six and verse two. On the third day, he will raise us up. So, uh, for Mr. Newbauer's position to stand, Hosea six and Hosea thirteen must be referring to the events surrounding the A.D. 70 destruction of Jerusalem. Because, Mr. Neubauer would say, that's when the resurrection took place. That's the resurrection. And, and if your mind is going all sorts of different ways, we'll, we'll talk about this at the end. But, but that's Mr. Neubauer's argument. The 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is, is not the bodily resurrection, the, the, the individual bodily resurrection of Jesus uh, described in Matthew chapter 28, but rather it was Jesus coming out of Hades and emptying Hades and opening the gate to Hades and Old Testament saints coming out of Hades in AD 70 at the destruction of Jerusalem when the last stone was pried from the temple. And I think that's important because the term corporate is going to get used a lot if you go watch the debate. And, and if I understood Mr. Neubauer, he's arguing in 1 Corinthians 15 that what you have there is not an individual resurrection, but a corporate resurrection. And by corporate, what we mean is a group. So, so what you just described, not just Jesus coming out of the grave, but all the Old Testament saints coming out of Hades. And, and right. I think that's why he wants Hosea 6 to be what Paul is quoting so much, because you have a corporate idea in Hosea chapter 6, mm -hmm. right? The pronouns are, are plural. Yes, the pronouns are plural there in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 2. After two days, he will revive us, and on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Uh, you go back to our previous studies of, of the, the idea of Hades as it was presented in this debate. Mr. Neubauer's idea of Hades is a place of separation from God, where Old Testament saints went awaiting the forgiveness that would be offered at the destruction, of, that would be fully realized at the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Hmm. Uh, so that when that last stone of the temple is, is pried off, now forgiveness and redemption are a present reality. And so we now, verse uh, chapter 6 and verse 2, we can now live in his sight because of the resurrection that occurred in AD 70 with the pulling down of the last stone from the temple. So again, rather than a personal, individual, bodily, talking about bodies, uh, resurrection, Mr. Neubauer is describing a corporate spiritual resurrection and and that's why i think he finds hosea 6 so attractive is because you've got the nations 
They don't ever come back from Assyrian captivity. They're going to go die there. And so if there is some sort of resurrection to be anticipated, it would have to be of a, of a spiritual sort. or of, of It's not going to be a physical resurrection at any rate, right. at least not in Hosea chapter 6. And so I think that's, that's why he wants this to be what Paul is quoting. Okay, so Sean, so you used two words there. Okay. Uh, let's talk about it a little bit. You mentioned nation. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned Assyria. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sean, when you're looking at Hosea 6 there, and, and you mentioned a nation, what nation are you talking about? Well, you've got Israel, the 10 northern tribes. And, of course, they're going to go into Assyrian captivity. Okay. So that's why you mentioned Assyria then. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Israel, the northern kingdom, right? We're, we're thinking back to after the death of Solomon, mm-hmm. uh, the, the kingdom of Saul, David, and, and Solomon divides. Uh, you've got Rehoboam over Judah, the sure the lower two tribes. <laughs> we should have looked and that up. And then you, you've got <laughs> Jeroboam over the 10 tribes, the northern kingdom. Uh, and, and as you're looking there at chapter six and verse four, you see Hosea using this language, right? You've got Judah, the southern kingdom, the two tribes, and then you've got the northern kingdom, Israel, which in Hosea is also called Ephraim. Mm-hmm. Um, for I think Ephraim was the largest tribe, if I'm not mistaken, I either think that's right. either by land mass or or by population there. But you've you've got both nations under consideration. But Hosea's primary focus, as we're looking throughout seems to be on the northern kingdom. Now, he is going to reference Judah. Sure. He is going to reference the southern kingdom. That would continue on after the northern kingdom mm-hmm. and, and would really be idealized as the, the covenant people of God moving forward in, mm-hmm. in, in the rest of the Old Testament, right? So chapter 6 and verse 4. Tyler, before you go on. Go, the reason, please, go ahead, Sean. The reason he's mentioning both, he has a slightly different message for them. Um, mm mm-hmm. The ten northern tribes are gone. They're going to captivity. Hosea is not a, a repenting prophet. He's not coming to tell them, if you repent, you won't go to captivity. He's coming to tell the ten northern tribes, no, nah, you're going. It, it's yeah. too late for you to do anything about it. God's already decided the Assyrians are coming. You're going away. You've measured up the, the full measure of your iniquity. There you go. To Judah, and what I think he's trying to get across to Judah is, hey, you need to pay attention to this. Look at your older brother. Yeah, don't follow in Israel's footsteps, because if you do, God will do the same thing to you. So there is a message of repentance for Judah. And of course, you're going to have Hezekiah come on the scene, and there's going to be a temporary uh, repentance. Uh, you're, going to, you're going to have Josiah come on the scene after that. There's going to be a period of repentance. Uh, but of course, after that, they're going to fall away and follow in Israel's footsteps going to the Babylonian captivity. So in regards to the 10 northern tribes, this is a message of judgment, pure and simple. Absolutely. If you want to talk about Judah, it's a message of repentance. But to the 10 northern tribes, it's judgment. Okay. So I think that's important to note there in Hosea chapter 6 and verse 4. Ephraim, what shall I do to you? O Judah, what shall I do to you? For your faithfulness is like a morning cloud, like the early dew it goes away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and your judgments are like that are like life that goes forth, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Chapter se- uh, 7 and verse 1. When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was uncovered, and the wickedness of Samaria, Samaria being... Uh, the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel here. So Hosea 6.4, making reference to Ephraim, the northern kingdom, Israel. The Assyrians would overrun Israel in judgment from God in 722 B.C. Uh, The northern kingdom would never again be reorganized into a nation. There would be some that would trickle out of that captivity back into the southern kingdom of Judah. But for all intents and purposes, the northern kingdom is gone after 722 B.C. You've got the distinction that we have noted in in verses 10 and 11 between Ephraim and Judah, between Israel and Judah, right? Absolutely. Okay. So immediately in the context of Hosea, in the context of this Old Testament prophet, we're, we're immediately hit with a difficulty of reading the AD 70 destruction of Jerusalem into this passage where the prophet is upbraiding 
the northern kingdom, which is going to be destroyed by the Babylonians, never to be reconstituted again. Mm. And then let's flip over to chapter 13. Okay. Chapter 13, which is the quotation in verse 14 that is found in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 55. Where Hosea says, chapter 13 and verse 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. Uh, look at verse 9 of chapter 13. O Israel, you are destroyed, but your help is coming. Chapter 13 and verse 12, the iniquity of Ephraim is bound up, his sin is stored. Chapter 13 and verse 16, Samaria is held guilty, for she has rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword, their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women with child ripped open. Verse, four, uh, verse 1 of chapter 14, O Israel, return to the Lord your God. Sean, when he's talking about Israel here, he's talking about Ephraim. He's talking about Samaria. He's talking still about the northern kingdom. Yeah, and this, this unavoidable judgment that is coming upon them. And he, he's going to bring it. And, and so if that's, and, and this is where I want us to realize I'm seeing some inconsistency in Mr. Neubauer's argumentation. He wouldn't say it the same way, and that's fine. We're just dealing with, with arguments here. But I see an inconsistency in the argument. If we have to take the Old Testament prophets in the context in which they spoke, and a New Testament writer cannot grant any new context to it, then if Paul is quoting Hosea 6 and Hosea 13 in 1 Corinthians 15, he is quoting from a background of the northern kingdom being set up for destruction by the Assyrians in 722 BC. There's nothing then mm -hmm. about AD 70 in that context. And with that rule, I, it's impossible to get there because Paul would have to be expanding on Hosea's thought, talking about something that Hosea would have never, under, under what situation would Hosea have ever considered AD 70 and a destruction of Jerusalem? Uh, that, that wasn't part of this prophecy. It's not found in this book anywhere. And so, Sean, here's, here, here's the point that, that I want to make to our audience then. If it's not a reference to AD 70 that Hosea has in mind when he is writing this, if in fact he's talking about the destruction by the Assyrians in 722 B.C., then Paul is not quoting Hosea 6 in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 4. Mm -hmm. And if he's not quoting Hosea chapter 6 and verse 2 in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 4, then he's not talking about a spiritual resurrection where bodies are being brought out of Hades. That, that would and seem to be the conclusion. And if that's not what he's talking about, then it's a different resurrection. Mm -hmm. It's a resurrection that's more closely associated with the actual person of Christ who walked on this earth. Those you would seem to be the, the two options. Yeah, you lose the inclusio argument. Mm -hmm. You know, something to point out is because both disputants made an inclusio argument in 1 Corinthians 15. The difference is Bruce Reeves made his out of 1 Corinthians 15. It, it had to do with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and the death, burial, and resurrection of, of mankind, of us. Mm -hmm. what, what Mr. Neubauer did was he, cre he made a, he, he sees a inclusio in Hosea between chapter 6 and chapter 13 that he then lifts and lays over 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so his point is, because I find a three-day resurrection in Hosea chapter 6, and then I find the quotation in Hosea chapter 13, then that has to be the, the entire context in which Paul is, is dealing. And uh, I may be getting ahead of things here. But that Oh, we've already gotten way ahead of things. We're okay, courageous. all right. <laughs> if, if I was a proponent of the AD 70 doctrine, 
I would not want to associate 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4 with Hosea 6 and verse 2. When is the resurrection in Hosea 6 and verse 2? It's on the third day. If I'm an AD 70 proponent, I don't need three days. I need 40 years. That's a problem. And that's, that's not a, I'm putting a problem there. That's a problem in the text that Mr. Neubauer didn't deal with. Now, Mr. Brees pointed this out to him, but I, unless I just fell asleep for a moment, I never heard him explain how the three days of Hosea 6 becomes 40 years in the New Testament. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, essentially. That is a major, major problem. So, so if that is the beginning of your inclusio, you've got, a, you've, got a, you've got a real dating problem, a real time problem when you get over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You don't have 40 years there. I think another problem we see here in chapter 6 and verse 2, Sean, mm-hmm. What's what's the difference between day two and day three in Hosea six and verse two? Yeah, what's the difference in revived and raised up? I mean, we we were Mr. Newbauer in the debate brought up the idea of of Hebrew poetry and understanding mm-hmm. Hebrew idioms and the Hebrew language. Absolutely. You've got a case of Hebrew parallelism going on here in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 2. It's just like back in in Proverbs. These six things the Lord hates, seven are an abomination to him, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same kind of idea. It doesn't mean that 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 seventh thing God doesn't hate, but it's still an abomination to him. It's just a way of expressing all of these things are bad. Right. And when you're here in Hosea chapter 6, verse 2, after two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up. It's the same idea of Hebrew parallelism here. It, this is not predicting a third day resurrection of Jesus, which isn't even, as you pointed out, the argument of, of, of realized eschatology in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 4. It's not the third day resurrection of Jesus there. It's the supposed resurrection that occurred in AD 70 when the last stone was pried from the temple. Right, and it's not Jesus, it's not an individual being raised in verse 2. It's the, it's the corporate body, it's the group. So, again, you know, if, if, if he wanted to come back and say, no, it is the body of Jesus under consideration in 1 Corinthians 15, which is not what he said, he still got a problem in Hosea 6. Because uh, it's, it's not an individual being raised, it's us. Revive us after two days, raise us up on the third day, that we may live before him. So you, you, you really have a hard time now. You're, you're, you're kind of stuck at this passage if you're an AD 70 proponent and you're saying Paul's quoting 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is quoting this passage to describe, describe what? I think that's a fair question. You know, that's a body, a, a, question. a group, a, a three-day resurrection, a 40-year resurrection. Which one is it? Okay, so... Sean, let's let's shift a little bit here. Okay. Okay. We've we've kind of gone through what the arguments were in the debate. Mm-hmm. Let's let's try to lay down then, Sean. As I look at Hosea chapter six and verse two, mm-hmm. what is going on in this text then? Is if it's not a prediction of a three day resurrection, then why does Hosea mention this concept of? being raised up on the third day. Do you have any thoughts on that? I I do. Um, You know, I think it helps. Would you like to share them with the class? Oh, is that what you meant? Okay. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think you have to go back to Hosea chapter 1 and 2 and see the figure there, and it's it's more than I think we want to read right now. But as you'll remember, Hosea was told to take a wife, a wife of harlotry. Um, I would argue that's not a practicing harlot, but rather a woman who was filled with the spirit of Israel. Hosea's book is going to call Israel harlots all the way through. It's talking about their idolatry. So go marry a woman of Israel, um, and she turns out to be an adulteress. And Hosea struggles with her, and he tries, and he tries. And chapter 2 is this heart-rending picture of this loving husband, you know, hedging up her way with thorns, doing everything he can to prevent her from 
this sinful lifestyle that she's chosen to live. But she won't have it. She ends up uh, just just being, I, I, you know, on the slave block. Let's just put it that way. Uh, he has to go buy her back. And this is all a metaphor for God's relationship with Israel. Israel has been an adulterous wife. And God has, has been patient with her. You know, we're all familiar with the story of Judges. We're all familiar with God's dealings with Israel throughout the period of the kings. He was so patient with her, wanted her to return, wanted her to be a faithful wife. She never was. And then finally he says, okay, you're done. And, and I think what's happening here, whether this is the actual response of Israel to Hosea's preaching. When you I, say here, you're in Hosea 6 now. Back in right? Hosea 6. I, I think, you know, whether this is the actual response of Israel to Hosea's preaching, or whether this is Hosea anticipating their mindset, which I kind of lean that direction. I, I think what they're saying is that God's going to do with us what he's always done with us. He's torn us, but he will heal us. You know, the book of Judges. Oh, he brought in an oppressor, but he also brought in a judge. He's wounded us, but he will bandage us. Yeah, we've had some rough patches, but, but God always comes back and, and, and cares for us again. He never abandons us. Go ahead. It's kind of this flippant attitude towards God. Absolutely, and towards the relationship that they should have with God. So will he send us into captivity? Maybe he will, but he'll come get us in a day or two. You know, he's he's not going to leave us there. He'll come back. He'll come back. He'll revive us after two days, maybe three. You know, this just kind of, and, and we've probably seen children that behave this way. Maybe maybe their parents aren't consistent in discipline, and they, they just don't believe the discipline. Well, it's not that God wasn't consistent. They're actually talking about the fact that he was consistent. He had consistently freed them from oppression. He had consistently relented in his punishments. And I believe what they're saying is they're, they're going to, he'll do that again. Verse three, so let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. Hey, Hosea, tell us what sacrifice do we have to make this time? <laughs> we'll go make a sacrifice and it'll please God's wrath and it's going to be okay. Why? Because his going forth is as certain as the dawn. That's how God responds. He will come to us like the rain, like the spring rain watering on the earth. He's reliable. He's dependable. He's not going to let us wither away. And then God answers in verse four, <laughs> you know, and, and have your parents ever said this to you when you were in trouble? What am I going to do with you? Usually wasn't something good that followed that question. What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? For your loyalty is like a morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. Now, that is a powerful expression. And you mentioned Amarillo a minute ago. I've lived here for almost six years. I've seen dew on the ground one time in Amarillo. <laughs> it's, it's a dry place here. And the only reason I saw that dew on the ground is I was outside about four in the morning. Why? I guess because I wanted to see if there was dew on the ground. But <laughs> I, was, I was out there early. And let me tell you something. That stuff goes away quick around here. It, it doesn't last. And, and that same thing, you know, we're in a drought right now, so... Every morning you get up and you go look outside. Are there any clouds out there? Well, a lot of times in the morning there are. But again, you, you better get up early because as soon as the sun gets up, they burn off. They, there's no truth to them. And, and he's saying your loyalty is like dew. And we're talking about an arid landscape. Your loyalty is like dew in the morning. It's not going to last. And so you come down to verse 6. And I think this is the response to this, this idea in verse 3, let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. Uh, I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. You know, earlier in the book, he's told them that the problem is that they don't know him. They, they're, they perish for a lack of knowledge. What an information. It was, it was the way the Old Testament uses that word know. They didn't have a relationship with God. I don't want you just to run down to the temple all the time and, and make a sacrifice. I want you to love me. I want you to obey yeah. me. Um, don't, don't, you know, it's not how well you say I'm sorry. It's how well you live before me. And so you know, I don't think this is talking about a, a prediction of a resurrection in chapter 6 mm -mm. at all. 
Now, if I'm wrong about that, it still doesn't fit 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This, this idea of a three-day resurrection doesn't help the AD 70 doctrine. No. I think if you'll just read through Hosea, the, the, what's, what's being done here is this is Israel's response to Hosea's preaching regarding the coming judgment. Does that make sense to you? I follow you, and and I think um, for those of you who are joining us, you just got a master class on the book of Hosea. <laughs> I don't know about minutes. that. But... So, so, Sean, the, the significance then of the third day, you know, we, we go through Scripture. Third day is a figure of release from bondage, from sin, even from death. These, these Jews would have been familiar with that, you know, um, Genesis chapter 1, You've got the first signs of life on the third day, Isaac, the third day in, in Genesis 22, Hebrews 11, Pharaoh's butler released from his sentence of death on the third day. You've got a lot of stuff happening concerning life on the third day. Maybe that's what they're doing there in, in Hosea chapter six and verse two. Maybe they've got that in mind, or maybe it's just them saying, God's always taking yeah. care of us, right? He'll raise up on the second day, maybe on the third day, but, but he'll take care of us like he always does. Yeah, and the message either, seems either to be, way. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. And the message now seems to be, I'm done with you. The Assyrians are coming and you're gone. I, I'm done with you as a nation. I think that's important yeah. to point out before we get over to chapter 13. I'm done with you as a nation, which kind of, you know, forces you to ask a question. Was everybody in Israel wicked? No. There's no reason to believe that. And when I read a passage like this, I'm always reminded of in the end of Malachi, where the faithful cry out, what about us? You know, has God forgotten us? And Malachi says, no, you're written in his book of remembrance. And I think when we get to chapter 13, that, that that's the idea that Hosea has under consideration in chapter 13. Okay, so I'm turning over there now. Let's go to chapter 13 and verse 14. Uh, actually, Sean, I'll take us back to, to verse 9, okay? Okay. O Israel, you are destroyed, but your help is from me. I will be your king, where is any other, that he may save you in all your cities, and your judges to whom you said, give me a king and princes. I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. The iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is stored up. The sorrows of a woman in childbirth shall come upon him. He is an unwise son, for he should not stay long where children are born. And while I'm looking at my Bible, Sean, I just saw you put on your glasses, by the way. Oh. Verse 14, <laughs> I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plagues. O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes, though he is fruitful among his brethren, an east wind shall come, the wind of the Lord shall come up from the wilderness, then his spring shall become dry, and his fountain shall be dried up. He shall plunder the treasury of every desirable prize. Samaria is held guilty, for she has rebelled against her God. They shall fall by the sword, their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their women with child ripped open. O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. It's a hard book to read, isn't it? It is. So, Sean, you brought us over here to chapter 13. What's going on here in chapter 13? Well, you know, again, judgment's coming. Yes. The nation is going to go into judgment. Chapter um, 13 and verse 9, O Israel, you are destroyed. There you go. But in me is thine help. So the nation is going to be destroyed. So what should the individuals in Israel do? Turn to God. Okay. Turn to God. And does that mean if I turn to God, I won't go to, to Assyria? No. No. No, you're going to go to Assyria. You know, and, and you're going to see the same kind of tension in the book of Jeremiah, right? What do we do about yep. this Babylonian guy? Well, go. Don't with. go to Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> you don't go to Egypt. Is God going to bless us? Well, he'll bless you. Oh, good. We'll stay in Jerusalem. Nope. Not if you want to be blessed by God. You know, you go to cap. Well, what are we doing in captivity? Just what Daniel did. Serve God. Serve God. Put your Serve faith, God. put your trust in God. I will be the there. King. Idolatry burned out of you. There you go. Get rid of this idolatry. And, and so, 
you see kind of this this back and forth, this tension between this national destruction and yet this this hand of God reaching out. I will be thy king, verse 10. Where is any other that may save thee in all thy cities and thy judges of whom thou sayest, give me a king, give me a king and princes. Listen, this this national thing that y'all set up up there where you've, you've just completely abandoned God's will. You set up your own kings. Israel was not supposed to set up their own kings. God chose their kings. Um, that There's no salvation in that. Uh, the iniquity, verse 12, the iniquity of Ephraim is bound up. His sin is hid. The nation is going to be destroyed. The sorrows of a travailing woman shall come upon him. He's an unwise son. Well, verse 13 is such a difficult figure. He should not stay long in the place of the breaking forth of children. The idea there is, is a child in, in distress in labor. And the midwife is trying to help, and the child is resisting. Well, what's going to be the end of that? Death. Death is going to come. So what hope is there for anyone going into this captivity who does serve God? You're telling us that that death and judgment is to come, but we're, we're going to go. What about those of us that are faithful? I will ransom them from the power of the grave. There's something more important than your physical redemption, and that is your salvation, your true redemption. But when are we going to find that? When I ransom them from the power of the grave. You're going to die in Assyria physically, but I'll raise you up. I'll, I won't leave you there. And by the way, that ties in with, with Hosea chapter 1. I don't know how far in the weeds we want to get in Hosea. Um, <laughs> But you remember he has he has his children there in Hosea chapter one, and their names are very important. They're very symbolic, mm-hmm. and they really play into the story. Uh, Loami, uh, Rohamai, or however you say it. Yeah. And then Jezreel. Yeah. And that word Jezreel is really important because that word Jezreel means both to scatter and to gather, kind of a farming term. So the farmer goes out and he scatters the seed, then he goes out and he gathers the crop. So what God is saying is, I'm going to sow this, I'm going to scatter this nation, and I'm going to gather my people. When does that happen? Well, you know, I pointed out that that Israel as a nation would never return. When you go over to Acts chapter 2, and you read that list of nations that are represented in Acts chapter 2, you have their Jews who left Israel in the Assyrian captivity and lived in Assyrian-governed provinces who are now returning. They're being gathered. And so you begin to see this promise of redemption in verse 14. But that's not the only redemption we're promised in Christ. It's not the forgiveness of sins in the moment, and that's it. No, we're promised full and final redemption, which is where Paul goes with this over in 1 Corinthians Corinthians chapter 15. 15. Mm -hmm. And he shows us that we're going to be redeemed from the grave, that we're going to be raised in in the same manner that Jesus was raised. And so we're going to be forgiven, yes, but we're going to be fully redeemed from the grave. What death has done to us through sin is going to be reversed in the resurrection. And so, Sean, that really does then form the inclusio argument there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If we want to focus on that kind of argumentation, mm-hmm. it's the, the personal, literal, bodily resurrection of Jesus that occurs in verse 4, and the personal, literal, bodily resurrection in the context of 1 Corinthians 15 of saints. Mm-hmm. And that Absolutely. just as Christ was raised from the dead, so we too will be raised from the dead. He being chapter 20, the first fruits. Mm-hmm. and we being the harvest. And, and I think it's worth pointing out quickly that this, this resurrection is not to life as you knew it before. Right. That this resurrection is to something far better, something different, which is why when we were in 1 Corinthians 15, I started in verse 50. He describes there a change. And, and it's a change that results in us being imperishable, immortal, different, than we were when we entered into the grave. So I, I think that that's, that's his point over here in, in verse 54, where he quotes from Isaiah, death is swallowed up in victory. Not just because bodies came out of the ground, 
You know, we see, we see temporary resurrections, almost divine recitations in, yeah. in scripture, you know, Lazarus. Well, Lazarus was raised to die again. Jesus was raised never to die again. He defeats death, and we follow in that. And so we're looking forward to something that is irrevocable, that is irreversible, that is full redemption from not only the guilt of our sins, I can find that in the blood of Jesus through baptism, but also redemption from what sin has, has put upon us. Uh, living in this decaying world, this sin-stricken world, uh, and, and everything that that does to us, resulting in physical death. Paul says that when, when, when Christ finishes his victory, all of that is going to be done away with. If bodies remain in the grave, then Jesus is not victorious. That's what Paul says. I think that's a great way to start to bring this then to a conclusion, Sean. So let's, I want to do one thing as we wrap up here. I want you to come back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 4. Okay. Uh, verses 3 and 4, actually. Okay. So Mr. Neubauer has said, chapter 15 and verse 4, that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, what you and I have gone through and demonstrated mm -hmm. is that Paul is not quoting from Hosea 6 here. But it does say according to the Scriptures. Sean, is there a passage in Scripture that addresses the idea of, of a resurrection of Christ, even a three-day resurrection of Christ? If you'll count Jesus as a prophet, which, by the way, we were told by Mr. Neubauer that Jesus is an Old Testament prophet. Hey, pause button. Let's hear Mr. Neubauer himself say that. Okay, let's play that clip. Again, my opponent, or those with him, do not know the voice of the prophets. Jesus is a Jewish prophet using Jewish language about a Jewish judgment. Okay, so Jesus is a prophet. Mm -hmm. Jesus is a Jewish prophet. Jesus is obviously living before he went to the cross. That places him under the Old Covenant, right? So we've got an Old Covenant Jewish prophet prophesying of what? A resurrection on the third day rooted in the story of Jonah. An individual's think, bodily resurrection. I, th I think that may be, Sean, what Paul has reference to here. I don't know why not. Uh, if Jesus himself makes the connection, why couldn't yeah. Paul make the connection? And it's rooted in, you know, I, Mr. Neubauer might say, well, scriptures means that which is written. Matthew wasn't written when Paul was writing. Jonah was. Mm -hmm. And so if Jesus has used Jonah in this way, then Paul absolutely has the right to follow Every suit. Every right to. And, and so whether, whether what Jesus said had been written down or not is – to me, is inconsequential. The book of Jonah was there. And, and surely Paul has the right to make the same application that Jesus makes out of Jonah's experience. So, Sean, if we're going to listen to the voice of the prophet, shouldn't we listen to the greatest prophet of all? I would hope so. I would hope so. So, then what, what is being talked about in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 4? Remember we said at the very start of this, Mr. Neubauer and Mr. Reeves have different definitions of terms. I want to play one more quote for you from the debate from Mr. Neubauer. Mr. Neubauer is going to say that whenever you see death or die in the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it's a reference to spiritual death, not physical death. Play that quote for me, Sean, please. All right, here we go. When Paul says we should not all sleep, and by the way, when he uses the word sleep, he means biological death. When he uses the word death, he means spiritual in its nature, just like Romans chapter 5. So sleep, according to Mr. Neubauer, means physical death. Die or death means spiritual death. And so what most people who claim to be Christians understand when they've come to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4 is not what Mr. Neubauer means. When he says it, and Mr. Neubauer himself admitted that in the debate. Mm -hmm. Verse four, 
According to Mr. Neubauer in verse 3, that Christ died, that's not physical death, that's spiritual death. That he died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried. Sean, we still have an answer for what that means, and, and I'd just like to make a note of, of that. We never heard in the debate if die means spiritual death, and this resurrection in verse 4 is going to be a spiritual resurrection from Hades. We still don't know what buried means. Right. I'm just what, what does it throw correspond it out there. to? Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, verse four, Mr. Neubauer is going to say then that resurrection that corresponds with the death must be a spiritual resurrection, not a bodily, personal resurrection. When Jesus came out of the tomb, he says, that's not what Paul's talking about here. Hmm. Paul's talking about Jesus and other Old Testament saints coming out of Hades. But Sean, as we look at 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 what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. This whole idea that sleep means physical death and die or death means spiritual death, Sean, that just doesn't work. No. And it doesn't work, uh, especially because of a passage you brought up last week there, chapter 15 and verse 20. Yeah, now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. So here the two terms are being used in the same sentence synonymously. Uh, so is it saying Christ has been raised from spiritual death, the first fruits of those who are spiritually dead? Or is it saying Christ has been raised from physical death, the first fruits of those who are physically dead? Well, if we're gonna if we're gonna make the same analogy that Jesus does in verse four, we're talking about physical death with Christ. Talking about physical death with Christ, everything after verse 20 is talking about physical death with us. And, and I, I don't know how we could get out of that. I think that is an excellent, excellent point. By the, the way, notice verse Paul, 22. I'm sorry, go ahead. The fact that Paul is going to use those two terms interchangeably in verse 20, uh, at least as I read the text, seems to argue against the application that Mr. Neubauer would make here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Right. Now, what were you going to say about verse 22? Well, you carry on that idea for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Well, what death do we all die like Adam? You know, this, this is, unless we're going to be Calvinists, this has to be talking about physical death. This is what we this is what we inherit from Adam is is mortality. Mm -hmm. So we've got physical death there. Which, by the way, if if I remember correctly, Mr. Newbauer agreed with uh, that that that's not spiritual death regarding Adam there. And he went over to Romans five, and he 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 quoted verse ten. You know, we follow in Adam's death because all have sinned. Talking about spiritual death, Mr. Reeves, the, I want to shake your hand. That, that's right. That's not what's being talked about here. So for as in Adam all die physical death, so also in Christ all will be made alive. So also. So there's a continuity of thought. Whatever we're talking about with Adam, we're talking about with Christ. Whatever we're talking about with Christ, verse 20, we're talking about with there you go. mankind. And then in the case of the faithful, we're seeing that change, that immortality, so forth and so on that we mentioned a moment ago. Sean, I think that's a great place to wrap this up. Here's the argument then of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Jesus died on the cross, not spiritually. He died physically. His spirit was separated from his body. Three days later, his spirit was back in that body, and he came forth from the grave, alive, resurrected. Never to die chapter, again. Never to die again. And then 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20, what happened with him is a promise of what will happen in the future for us, a resurrection in the same kind as his. There you go. That's a, that's a hope-filled doctrine right there. It we is. have something to look forward to that's far better than this. So much better than hurricanes and corona and every <laughs> other unpleasant thing that we're having to deal with in 2020. Absolutely.
Yeah, if there was ever a year to think about the resurrection doctrine, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, we thank you all so much for joining with us. Uh, we have gone somewhere around an hour right now after we chop everything up. So again, if you made it, give yourself another gold star. If you connect, if you collect seven gold stars, uh, if you're an office fan, we'll give you a Stanley nickel. Oh, wow, man. I may start collecting those stars. So we're doing this about as, about, about the same average as your sermon length, right? Ouch. Ouch. I am me. I am not Bruce Reeves. So <laughs> just. <laughs> So what have you selected for next week? <laughs> That's a nice way to pawn it off. Sean, I have been going through so much personally. I don't remember what we talked about that we're <laughs> going to talk about for next week. Well, there was an interesting argument that Mr. Neubauer made that kind of surprised me uh, regarding miracles and when miracles cease. That's right. And first Corinthians chapter 13 and the idea of the cessation of miracles. And that if that is, if that is true, then how can we be anticipating? Uh, and, and I believe his phrase, and I, I agree with his phrase, by the way, the greatest miracle of all time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I thought that was interesting. Uh, I'd not heard someone make that argument. Um, I, I wouldn't mind examining that argument because if he's right, he's right. Um, and, and, Let's look at what the Bible has to say about that. Sounds good to me. Let's jump in with it next week. All right, man. Sounds good. Appreciate you. Thanks for being here, Sean. Always a pleasure to be with you and everyone out there. We look forward to being back with you next week. Take care.